In which of these two groups of houses would you choose to live? The group on your left or the group on your right? If you, choose, if you chose the group on your right, you're the same as me. There, people have smaller houses but larger shared spaces in which they're encouraged to communicate. It's well known that social connection in a community makes people healthier. These shared spaces may contain trees and plants, maybe even a community garden. It's also well known that people are healthier if they live in or near green space. If you have kids, imagine them running out the back to play with each other without having to cross any roads. They may even eat some fresh fruit and veg from the garden, if you're lucky. They come home tired but healthy, and you haven't had to get into a car and drive them anywhere. If you don't have kids, imagine the joy and benefit of a garden, fresh eggs from chickens, knowing that when you go away on holidays, it will still all be looked after. Imagine knowing that there is usually someone around in your neighbourhood ready for a cup of tea or a chat if you're lonely. As you age, imagine feeling safe and not worrying about all those outside jobs you have to do because you know there are many hands in your community doing those same jobs. Imagine your older kids coming home after being away to an environment that's warm and friendly where they can feel they belong. Now, imagine living in that group of houses on your left, where, let's face it, it's very easy not to get to know your neighbour, apart from perhaps maybe you knock over all their wheelie bins as you back out of your driveway. This way of living on the right has been done in times long past and is currently done in a small number of places in the world today. Here in Adelaide, we have Christie Walk, for example. But why aren't there more of them? What's stopping that group of houses on your left from becoming that community on your right? Many housing developments seem to assume that this is the way we want to live. But did you know that this grid pattern urban layout, where houses and streets are lined up at right angles to one another, was actually used as a way of maintaining law and order centuries ago? Imposing that grid pattern over existing villages change the meaning and use of space. Today, perhaps, it's more about maximising return on investment for developers or just maintaining the status quo. But perhaps this way of living on your right just isn't sustainable. I mean, I know it increases the plants and biodiversity in the local area, and studies have shown that green space lowers the temperature around houses in summer and decreases the amount of stormwater heading out into the streets. But perhaps it's just not sustainable with regards to energy use, for example. So I looked into that. I asked myself, is it possible to set up a community energy system so that it sources most, if not all, of its power from the sun? And what might that community look like? Maybe this group of houses on your left is better suited to maximising the use of renewable energy. At the beginning of all my research, I came across an architect called Chuck from California, and he's actually built numerous community precincts, and so I, I gave him a call. And at the end of my conversation, he said to me, Kiralee, the key takeaway that you need to remember, the one most important thing about all of this is that people talk to one another. You know, I later found out that was a good bit of advice, but at the time, it wasn't the key that I was looking for. So I, I looked for my own answers. And I found that if people do form communities like that on your right, they can act as one electricity user with one connection to the wider electricity grid and this means they can share their solar power before they import or export to the wider electricity grid, and this can get them substantially cheaper electricity bills. But enabling policies need to be in place. You may already know that the energy use of a house peaks in the morning, dips in the middle of the day, and peaks again in the late afternoon. So if we were to face our solar panels to catch more of the morning sun, 
and some to catch more of the late afternoon sun, we can better match those peaks with energy generated from our solar panels. We can self-consume more of our own solar rather than buying it from the grid. In some scenarios in Australia where you cannot send your excess solar to the grid, uh, and you had, say, enough money to buy 25 solar panels for your roof, I found out that you were far better off putting only 17 solar panels on your roof, but adding a small battery instead. But so fantastic, we have a community that is increasing, sharing and increasing their use of renewable energy. But hang on a minute. Some people will say, we're sharing renewable energy here, but not everyone necessarily has a solar system on their roof, and given different households use different amounts of energy, how can we fairly divide that community electricity bill between each house? So we developed a method to allow residents to do that in a fair but easy way. So, all of these results relate to greening the energy supply, which is critical. But we also need to look at reducing the amount of energy we use, and perhaps shifting when we use the energy to times when renewable energy is more abundant. But you know, scientists studying this topic always seem to end up at the same point, which is that even with energy efficient housing, and energy efficient appliances, and energy feedback devices telling us when we're using too much energy, the actual energy use of a household is still more than expected. The more efficient our appliances become, the more we use them, and the more devices we buy, and so on. It's a well-known paradox. And there's even more to it than that. Studies have shown that even when people want to be environmentally friendly and have every intention of being environmentally friendly, they still don't necessarily use less energy. Why is that? Well, I don't know. Perhaps, partly, it might be due to the fact that, say, it's five o'clock in the evening, you've got dinner cooking on the stove behind you, you've got two hands changing a baby's nappy, one foot trying to prevent a toddler from stapling their eyelids shut or something, and then you can smell your dinner burning in the background, and all the while you're thinking about the clothes that need to be washed by tomorrow. I think we know where you'd like to stick that energy feedback device. But it is assumed in many places that people know about and are informed about their electricity use. And that given as many options as possible, they would behave economically rationally and choose the cheapest electricity contract available. A competitive electricity market requires consumers to behave economically rationally. An individual choice sounds good, but studies have shown that when people have a lot of choice, often they'll just do nothing. That when overloaded with information and daily complexity, they find it difficult to optimise and they'll just choose the first available option. That people rarely behave economically rationally. Let's face it, who here finds it easy to make sense of their electricity bill? And the thing is, in giving people all this choice, Layers of regulation are put down, which just may prevent people from forming communities like that. And you know, all the while, I can hear Chuck's voice in the back of my head telling me that the key takeaway is that people talk to one another. And I realise that many of these perceived engineering issues may in fact be ameliorated simply by people forming socially cohesive groups. Because studies also show that people use trust when they're making their decisions, that they conform to social norms within a group, that they make better decisions by talking to one another. So thanks for that bit of advice, Chuck. Because it reinforces that we, that we can't just use technology. We need social cohesion to make for a better future. And you know, if it is supposed that abundant choice lowers electricity bills, then presumably the choice for an individual or group of individuals to get together and form a community and act as one electricity user would be important. 
This is what it could look like to not only share, but increase your use of renewable energy, also share ideas, form new social norms, and perhaps produce many other benefits along the way. So this all leaves me with just one question. Do you think it's time we made it easier for people to live this way and had better choices in our urban form? Thank you.